Thank you all for letting me come and speak. I really appreciate it. I'm going to give a quick speech. Uh, it's going to be called California's Next Century. By the way, I just published a book called California's Next Century. There it is. And it will sort of explain what the title's about. Um, I'll make a quick speech and then turn it over to questions and answers. So first, I'm going to make a series of radical claims. And up front, they're going to seem too good to be true. But what I'm offering is that if we make a shift in the way that we as Californians operate and that our government operates, and a little bit of inspiration, all of the radical claims I'm just about to make can be true and at the same time. So first, the radical claims. One, half your taxes removed. Half a business bureaucracy for every business in California removed. At the same time, public schools in the poorest neighborhoods brought up to not just the best in America, but the best in the entire world. Our bridges, dams, roads, airports, seaports, and every other basic infrastructure brought up, brought up to the best in the entire world. Right now, they're the worst in all of America. Let me throw in a couple more. 50,000 new blue collar jobs, 200,000 new white collar jobs, and a recession proof an economy. And what I'm talking about is gearing the California state economy so that you, your kids, your grandkids, and your grandkids' grandkids never go through a recession like we're going through now. A few more. World peace, increased international trade, uh, a greater sense of art and culture and business related to that happening here in California, improved quality of every single government leader and every single government appointed position like you've never seen before, and a return to local control like you haven't seen since the 1960s. And besides public schools being approved, university educations, where when you get one, you're not saddled with debt like we used to have in the 1960s. I know, I know, it seems radical, and that's what the response was generally at the other speeches. <laughs> Here's how it's possible. Uh, first, a quick history lesson, and then you know, come back around. Um, so in the next 20 to 40 years, there's going to be new superpowers with as much money and power and raw influence as America. Not that America's going down, but you have what's called the rise of the rest. Other countries will be coming up, and they will be having as much influence and power. And they're also going to be wanting their own stake and sphere of influence. Their names are going to be China, India, Russia, possibly a Southeast Asian collective, ASEAN, and Brazil. This also includes Europe and America. Right now, Europe already has more wealth than America. We don't typically talk about that. So what's happening is that as these global powers are rising up, they want their piece of the pie, just like America got to have. And they want their sphere of influence. And they want people to respect them the way America was respected the last 70 years. Go back to World War II. For the last 70 years, you had democracy, capitalism, and communism, and sort of dictatorship. The relationships were stark. So people sort of picked one or the other. Now, there is no more communism. Everybody's figured out that capitalism and some form of democracy <coughs> is the way to go. However, take a look around. India, China versus America, they're capitalists. They don't operate the same. Yes, people are willing to switch dollars and make money, but if you look at the government and the way things operate, there's different opinions about how economies operate and governments operate. So what happens when there's not just America and another opinion, like when you had America and the Soviet Union, but now America and six other different options for how to do business and international trade and growth? Well. We can already see the writing on the wall. You have foreign policy experts, by the way, all of this is thoroughly documented, and I got a 20-page section in the back of the book going all over all of the terms. You have foreign policy experts now saying that we've seen a situation like this before. The period of 1880 to 1910, or the lead up to World War I, World War II. You had new powers at that time, Japan, Germany, and Italy, who were rising, and they were growing rich. They wanted their piece of the pie. Most of the planet was owned by other European powers in America. These new powers, they wanted the same respect, the same amount of wealth. For a while, international trade grew and things worked out. But then at some point, Japan walks out of the League of Nations. Germany does the same. Italy does the same. And things quickly start moving along. Not saying that's happening, but you have foreign policy experts saying that the pattern that we're seeing now mirrors that pattern 
over a 30 year period leading up to World War One. World War II. Here's why. The new powers are going less to the UN, less to the IMF, less to the G20, less to all the international global cooperation networks and centers that were built up over the last 70 years. They don't feel that these organizations that have got everybody to talk together for close to a century represent them. And there's something to that. The UN has never had an oversecretary, and the IMF has never had a president who wasn't American or European for 70 years. So you try to tell the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, Southeast Asians, and the Brazilians, oh, it's about you too. <laughs> they don't buy it. Here's what they're doing. They're making their own. Shanghai Cooperation Council, Brazil has one, India has one. They're starting to make their own UNs, and they're inviting people in. And they're specifically not inviting America to the party. <laughs> because they want to make sure that they're the dominant power in their sphere of influence. Already going that way. Switzerland was a little country in Europe. And for the last 200 years, most of the business, international, art, science, and government negotiations happened in a place called Geneva, Switzerland. But in the last two years, the mayor of Geneva, Switzerland, and the government of Switzerland themselves have said that they can no longer serve as the global discussion nexus for the world like they've done in the last 200 years. They've said this themselves. I argue in California's next book, by the way, extensively cited, and I look all over the world, California is the only land, place, people, area that can fulfill Switzerland's role of keeping everybody discussing all the businesses, all the negotiation that happened for the last 200 years, but for the next century. We have the exact demographic dynamics and a acceptance of diversity that goes back 100 to 500 years, if you look at California history, that is simply not found in other places in the world. Switzerland, when they were the Global Negotiation Center, got to be that way because they were part German, Italian, and French. So they were able to go to the European countries and say, we speak your language, talk here. We're already making European people work. We see ourselves as Swiss, but we speak French and German and Italian. That worked for 200 years. We need a new place with the same dynamic to be able to offer the same service for the new global situation coming up that's going to happen no matter what. We can do this here, or nobody else is going to be able to pull it off. We can have the wealth and economic security of Switzerland and secure world peace, or we can stay in a recession for another 10 years, maybe 20, depending on the, uh, what analysis you're looking at, and continue to let the old world fall apart. Start choices, thoroughly cited in California's next century, and that's what I'm offering to you. Take a look. If you type in Marcus Rees Evans or California's Next Century online or type in Marcus Rees Evans on YouTube, there's a bunch of other speeches and explanations and a detailed uh, summary of the book. Um, that's the end of the speech, and I'll turn it over to questions. Where in California would you say the new location would be? Ah, very good. Um, I haven't thought that far ahead. <laughs> 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 the, the, the answer is... Uh, I'm going out getting this idea out, mm -hmm. but what it looks like is going to require a million different detailed conversations and ideas, which can only happen with a good chunk of the people of California thinking about this and saying, this is how I interpret it. This is how I picture the way that it's supposed to be. I'm hoping to plant the seed, but what you're talking about is something that would happen with a population-wide discussion, and it would be whatever people think. But I would throw out San Francisco is a financial capital of the world. Los Angeles is a recognized entertainment capital of the world. Uh, Sacramento is a capital capital of the world. So, uh, yeah. yes, please. I don't know. I don't have a question, but I have a comment, and uh, it's just from my cynical perspective. Absolutely, I love hard questions. Our California being you know, almost bankrupt, and uh, <laughs> here you're telling us that we're going to be reducing half of our taxes and. Um, it sounds wonderful, right. but I am skeptical. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's interesting because I've been giving this speech and people don't find the idea of California being a global center strange. They don't find the idea of California being different from America strange. What they find strange is what you're asking. Do we as Californians have what it takes to be able to do this on our own? Or would we just sort of fall apart if left to our own devices? Uh, we lose $80 billion a year 
in extra federal income taxes, even during the recession. So you pay all federal income taxes. That pays for military, Social Security, et cetera. There's $80 billion left over. That goes to pay for roads, schools, dams, seaports, and air bridges in 35 other states that already have schools, bridges, dams, and roads better than we have in this state, according to the federal government. So the federal government says, California, we ranked all the states. Yours are worst. Mm -hmm. These people are already doing well. By the way, we need that $80 billion to make sure they continue to do better than you. This has gone on for 30 years. Plus, we never got our 9-11 security funding for not five years after 9-11. We paid for that. The nuclear radiation detectors at the seaport of LA and Oakland, you paid for it with special trucker taxes. So you pay for uh, income, you're supposed to get national defense, you don't get it, your state dollars go in to pay for it, so you're being doubly taxed. If we stop paying for things we don't get, and we stop paying money for things that help other people, you're starting to look at a $100 billion surplus almost instantly. Yes, please. So I think you didn't bring up the big point in your speech, but it just came out in response to the comment. You're, you're proposing secession. No. I'm proposing what Scotland did in the last five years. Okay, the evolution. Uh, you're familiar. Yes. yes. Uh, so Scotland, real quick, in the last five years, Scotland has been a colony territory of England. All of their decisions were handled in London. In the last five years, through a series of votes, the military and the dollar stayed intact. But all other policy decisions like banking, immigration, uh, housing, finance, education, moved to the new capital of Scotland, Holyrood. By the way, subnational sovereignty is a form of government found in 25 to 30 other countries around the world right now who have existed for 100 years and exist in all other parts of the world. So it's a universally applicable form of government and it continues to grow. Iceland just did the same thing. Liechtenstein is looking at it and Quebec is also doing this. It's growing. And if we go back to the previous century, there's another 10 countries that have had this form of government. And I also explain in the book why California has a legal case for this in a way that only the Hawaii does. So the argument that I'm saying that is applicable for California for legal reasons to look into this applies only to California and Hawaii. And namely, that has to do with the uh, original laws that allowed for the settlement of America and the original laws that allowed for the creation of the states. America has violated its own law for settling America and for creating states when it created the state of California. I can go into details, but there's an extensive legal case there. By the way, already recognized by British legal scholars and the foreign diplomatic envoy of Russia. So there's something there. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate it.